Special thanks to our promotional partners at the American Philatelic Society. The APS is the largest stamp collecting organization in the world, supporting collectors of any level worldwide. For more information about membership and APS services, visit stamps.org. I'm Charles Epting from H.R. Harmer in New York City. And I'm Michael Cortese of Noble Spirit in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And this is Conversations with Philatelists. Now, Michael, today's guest is someone I've wanted to have on since episode one. This is one that um, I think everybody uh, everybody knows that we should have him on. He's, um, you know, one of the most vocal uh, spokespeople for the hobby. Do you want to tell people who we're going to have on today? Yeah, if they so didn't we're... look at the title of the episode. Fair, fair, fair. Um, <laughs> So today we're talking to Scott English, executive director of the APS. Um, he's Scott. You, you go ahead. Cause no, well, again, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot. There's so much to say. I mean, he's been director of the APS since 2015. Um, 2017, they renewed his contract. 2019, they renewed his contract. They're just, I think, they're just really pleased with him. Um, Scott he, is um, maybe the most prominent uh, figure, at least in the organized, institutionalized side of the hobby. Scott right. is the guy who gets interviewed, um, you know, by the newspapers who, uh, you know, he, he is, um, he's really on the front lines of the battle for philately. Um, yeah. If that's even a thing. No, but he, he's, um, he's, he's really a vocal proponent for the hobby. He's just a great spokesperson and asset. And I know that over the last couple of months during uh, quarantine, he's been, you know, what I love about him is even though he's the executive director of the APS, he goes on Zoom with, any stamp club that wants mm-hmm. to have him. Um, and, you know, even without the quarantine, he, he goes to shows, he goes to local club meetings, he joins these local clubs. He really is um, involved at the grassroots level of the hobby, which I think is fantastic. He's not, you know, isolated in his, um, you know, ivory philatelic tower. He's out there talking to people on Zoom, talking to people, um, again, these little local shows have a direct line of communication with the executive director of the APS. I think that's awesome. I think that's incredible. Yeah. He's taking outreach into his own hands. He's not just hiring a bunch of people and, and, and saying, Hey, go, go bring in. Exactly. Sitting back and, you know, he's, he's the one out there fighting for this hobby. Um, I I think that's, um, you know, partially because I'm sure we'll get into his um, background in politics, but I think he knows the, the value of a handshake, the value of getting out there and meeting someone face to face. I think he's brought that to philately. Mm-hmm. which is which is amazing to see and i think we're really lucky to have him um again fighting the, the good fight for philately yeah absolutely i'm super excited to uh to so talk I, I don't i don't think I, you've never i've never met him really why well, I, 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 I may have passed him at an aps show or or some other show but i don't think i've you're ever you're maybe the only person in the hobby who hasn't <laughs> met him then because he's well, so, we're so but... isolated here that's true. That's true. But I, I, what I was going to say, I, I think we should, uh, there's so much to talk about with Scott that let's mm-hmm. stop talking about him and let's get him in here because, yeah. um, you know, whatever we say, he, he's going to have a lot more to add to the conversation. Right. So let's let's get him on it again. Yeah, perfect. Exactly. Let's bring him in. Awesome. All right. Here we go. Hey, Scott. Hi. All right. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I made sure my, uh, my hair was cut before talking to you. I didn't want any, uh, <laughs> I did not action going on. <laughs> Well, I uh, I did let it grow for a while, but once the uh, once the Commonwealth allowed us to go and get haircuts again, I went ahead and did that. So, how um how have you been? Uh, not bad. We've been pretty busy here, and uh, you know, as you can imagine, we we have a lot going on. We did have, uh, you know, we were closed for two months, but mm-hmm. that that didn't stop us from doing things. We were continuing operating. I I will admit that uh, some of us may have violated the governor's orders by coming into the office, but. Do you want us uh, to cut this out of the broadcast so that you don't have no, state no, police showing up at your door? I've admitted to it publicly. Interestingly enough, well, we just had a court case on that uh, here in, in Pennsylvania, and uh, the determination was we should not have been forced to close. So hmm. um, that wasn't an APS lawsuit. It was a general lawsuit brought yeah. by some business owners here in the state. Um, and the, the total closure of business was was considered in violation of the law. So. Are you? But we at, did it. We um, did it anyway. Yeah. Are you at the APS right now? I am. Nice. So, wh- wh- where are things at right now? It's um, it's middle of September. What you know? Mm-hmm. A, a, you've had a very productive summer. Very productive um, online stamp show. Um, you know, for for somebody who maybe went to summer seminar in the past or visited the APC, um, you know, wh- where are things at for the APS right now? 
So right now, the expectation from the state is that we continue to operate on a modified basis. They're, they're encouraging us to allow telecommuting to the greatest degree that we can. And, you know, with two months of closure, we certainly got a lot of business processes put in place that allowed us to continue to operate, even if we didn't have most of our staff in the building. So on a daily basis now, we have about 50 percent of the staff that report to work here at the APC, and then the rest of them work from home. Um, in the last month, one of the I don't know if you all have been tracking this, but State College is now one of the fastest growing hotspots in the country. And that's contributed, of course, to our return of our students at Penn State. But uh, and so that's that's my concern about reopening right now. I, I don't um, I think the area is experiencing a difficulty that I don't want to bring our members into. And then on top of that, being able to maintain safety precautions inside the building with uh, with folks who, you know, are going to go through varying degrees of, cap- you know, willingness to go through that, uh, you know, wearing a mask, getting, you know, getting your temperature checked, all of those things. It's just a lot more than I think most of our members really want to go through when they, if they came to the building. So we feel like in an abundance of caution, it just makes sense right now to continue to stay just open to the staff only. So were you able to put some of the, uh, the services back in place? Like it, I know at one point you'd closed, um, all receiving certificate applications and anything like that and circuit book sales. Are those continuing? Circuit books, you know, circuit books shut down and I did a presentation for the the membership in August at the virtual stamp show and circuits dropped off to almost nothing in April. Mm-hmm. And part of that is because, you know, the, the people participating in the program weren't comfortable with going to the post office, didn't want to have to go out for unnecessary reasons. So we just shut the whole process down. We do have that back in place. We do have it operating. We still have approximately a hundred people who, you know, who are not receiving circuits. Uh, and so that does, that has dropped off some of the, uh, some of the, the circulation that we have. What's interesting though, is that buying is up in circuit. So even though we have fewer books out on the streets than we do on an average basis, uh, sales are above and beyond that. Uh, so they're operating expertizing. We did, we did almost completely stop. That was, to, that's a two-step process, which is I couldn't really have anybody inside processing it. And even if we did, uh, we weren't really comfortable with sending material out because there was just a, a lack of certainty about whether experts would be able to take material, get material, that sort of thing. Uh, we're at about a 90 day, uh, we're about a 90 day window right now in terms of turning certificates around. It was much worse than that. Ken Martin, who just took over as advertising director in June, has done pretty much yeoman's work. He and Crystal Harder are the two folks that have been processing those. And our experts are really working double time to get things uh, back to us as quickly as possible. Postal delays have, have affected our ability to get those certs out as fast as we would like. Uh, but that's starting to clear up as well. So it's encouraging. I think by the end of the year, we'll be under the 60 day window and most, you know, at least half of our certs will turn around in 45 days. Looking at this big picture, I've, I've listened to a lot of APS town hall meetings over the years, um, you know, pre COVID. And there's always been a lot of interest in incorporating more technology and more digital presence into the hobby. I think that's something a lot of people have been pushing for and and certainly something that we've talked about in terms of the APS in the past. Do you think that, is there a silver lining to the quarantine? Is, are there things that have been born out of coronavirus that you think will have lasting positive changes for the hobby? Because the APS has been great with their, their chats, with putting, um, you know, older content on to online and, and onto YouTube. Do you think that, um, maybe there were a lot of things that, were on the back burner that people were reluctant to undertake. And the last couple of months have sort of forced those issues um, to the forefront and, and giving up, given us an excuse as a hobby to look more towards the digital era. So in 2018, I did a presentation to the APS and the APRL boards in Birmingham at uh, Ameristamp, one of the last ones we did. And I talked about this technology initiative because it's, it's good in concept, but it doesn't really mean much unless you, put, uh, unless you put a detailed plan together. And so that's what I laid out. Part of the reason why I did that is because it was a fundraising pitch, not just to the board, but to our membership as well. Financially, when I got here in 2015, the APS had a huge technology deficit. That's not something people talk about much, but you know, we're, 
we were operating on a model that was really about 15 years old and in and in computer years that's it might as well be a hundred so we started you know we started undertaking this we did some we made some very deliberate changes to the website to improve web traffic i mean if you think about this at the time of the launch of our new website in 2018 we were getting about 16 17 thousand people a month to that website part of that was because our search engine optimization wasn't very good it wasn't mobile friendly and it really wasn't even uh tablet friendly and even though there were some you know hiccups along the way when we did that launch you see that the traffic uptick in the next year is about 8,000, 9,000 new people a month. So that means that on a, on a regular basis, people started seeing a reason to come back again to the website, wanted to use it, started finding it on the internet and so forth. At the beginning of this year, we introduced a new section to the website. The reason why we did that was because we really wanted to blow up our search engine optimization to the point where we would be a part of you know, millions of hits, not just thousands or hundreds of thousands of hits. So, you know, when the when the pandemic hit, our search, you know, our uh, search impressions went from about 600,000 a month to about 1.2. They're up to about 1.5 million a month now, which means that we're slowly working our way through the search engine and we're showing up more often and more frequently for people who are looking for information that that's paid off. So we have about 40,000 people a month that come to our website. But in that presentation, I put a I put an image on the screen. It was a it was a typewriter, a classic typewriter with an iPad screen that was on the back end of it. And the 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 reason why I did that was to talk about balance because you have to serve two interests when you're talking about technology: those who are able to adapt and those who are not able to adapt. And you know, honestly, with our membership being predominantly older. Uh, there's a reservation sometimes about jumping into technology without a purpose. You know, they don't, it's, it's very esoteric to, to, you know, someone who's in their sixties or seventies or eighties. Well, I don't need technology. I can go to my stamp club meeting. I can go to my stamp show. I can do all of these other things. Once you take all of those things away, all of a sudden you see an adaptation happening at a rate far beyond what I would have ever expected without this pandemic. So you're right. Yes, Charles, the, 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 the long answer to that short question is yes, there is a uh, there is indeed a silver lining here. We're definitely seeing ad, uh, adaptation. I mean, I go to local stamp club meetings and there's nothing there's nothing greater than seeing someone who's 85 years old, who's brought their iPad up and they're there and they're on the screen and they're communicating. They know how to mute. They know how to handle a Zoom meeting. <laughs> I've seen people on Zoom who I never thought I would see digital, and it is fantastic. So, mm. so you think there's 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 things that will come out of this that will carry on into the future? You know, I can't wait for there to be another physical stamp show. I can't wait. You know, I, I was looking forward to Hartford. I can't wait to you know see everyone again in person. But but I would imagine that there will be elements of the digital show that may carry forward and um, you know maybe form sort of a hybrid model moving forward. The, this is a lesson I, I learned in politics and it carries over to here. And that is the only thing worse than not giving people what they want is taking away what they like. So what has happened is as people have gotten more comfortable with using technology with the expectation that they could participate in a, I mean, think about the StampX is coming up. You guys just did a, a show on this a couple of weeks ago and StampX is coming up. The idea that I can get online and go to a show in, in England without actually getting on a plane and going over there. Uh, means I can manage my time better, means I can get access to the things that I want to see. I don't have to make the dollars and cents decisions anymore. That is absolutely something that we have to do. And, you know, one of the things that we're talking about now, because we're in the planning phase for 2021, and, and you know, Sarasota just canceled their show. So we know that in the early part of next year, we're still going to see significant disruptions. Uh, the CDC director testified yesterday that he didn't think a widespread vaccine was going to come until spring or, or summer of next year. There may be some discussion about that. But I think commercially available, widespread available to American citizens, it's going to take that long. And given that we have time, and this is what we're trying to do, is plan deliberately for what does it look like once we get back to a physical show again to create that accessibility that people have come to expect. Um, you know, if you look at other sectors where they do trade shows, 
what's interesting is when you come to the the stamp show everyone says well the dealer board is the most important thing and i don't disagree with that i think it's great you know the dealers have been uh a lifeblood for the hobby for a very long time we know that the model is changing and we're seeing dealers change with it but one of the things that's always somewhat understated at all of these shows but shouldn't be are the speaker experiences going to the talks they they can be very well done they can be very uh very popular with attendees they can be a meaningful part of the event that you're going to we have never really created that that sense of fomo right fear of missing out and in establishing why is it that i should go see so and so speak for the classic society as an example when i go and sit down and talk and even though i'm not a classic collector it's a it's a very educational talk and and i think in my sense i have to think about the number of people who aren't there and wonder why they're not there and so try to figure out ways to get them there so we have to bring that experience to people in their homes because not everyone's going to be able to make it to chicago next year it, kind of speaking on that the the APS stamp store allowing dealers to send in their um their stamps to the to the APS to sell for them has kind of been blossoming um while there's no shows is there is there an initiative to keep that kind of going as shows open up to to bring in dealers that that aren't traditionally show dealers but send their excess stock or you know what's kind of the the plan there if you will that's a great question. You know, one of the things that we launched last year was a uh, was a, a, a redesign of Stamp Store. Uh, it was supposed to go live on April the first. We all know why it didn't go live on April the first. I have the the product ready to go. I'm just going to be honest with you. I've said this at the town hall meeting before, but uh, it, it, the reason why I have it transitioned over is because sales are going so well right now. I am not going to fix what ain't broken. <laughs> but but we do have a very long term plan. One of the things that that we want to look at when we move over to the new platform is being able to create a dealer badge so APS dealer members can and and remember not you know we have 500 540 dealers. We don't you know they're not just show dealers. These are pe dealers of all types. Some some of them are eBay dealers. And so we want to create a dealer badge that allows you to know who are you supporting, what are you getting involved in and uh, be able to allow that. The second phase of that is then allowing self-posting and self-hosting. That is, you want to put the material up yourself. You can do it at a lower fee than you would do if you send all of the material to us. Um, and really, what we're trying to sell is the idea of trust. That is, you know who you're buying from because they're an APS member. And you know that if something goes wrong, the APS is here to make sure that we take care of it that we get it resolved as quickly as possible. And then ultimately, if it's not, then there's a consequence for the person selling the material who was dishonest. Mm. So yeah, that's the that's the transition we see coming over the next 18 months. Yeah, that'll be exciting, almost kind of like their own, yeah, an APS marketplace, um, really. Yeah, you mentioned, I, go, ahead. go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, that was one of the chief reasons why we started the APS back in 1886 is because uh, the markets had been sort of tapped out from the at the local level. Uh, it didn't matter what chapter you belong to around the country. You basically knew all the people you were selling to, and you ended up accumulating material that nobody there wanted to buy. And so part of the benefit of the APS was we created this national organization. And the, the very first thing we created before we even created a journal was an exchange service, which is what circuit sales is today. So acquisition was the number one purpose for creating it in a marketplace where you could trust the buyers. Nothing's changed, just the way that we do it has. Hmm. Uh, so that's what we're working on. So I know that the sellers have to be APS members, but do the buyers from the APS stamp store need to be APS members as well? They don't have to be. All you have to do is create an account. That way we know who we're dealing with, but okay. uh, they do not have to be an APS member. We find that if they buy enough material they that... Have to be. Yeah. They want to be because there is a certain discount that you get for being an APS member versus being a non-member. So ultimately, if they realize that they found a wealth of material that they want to buy into, paying $45 a year isn't such a bad idea after all. Right. <laughs> you mentioned briefly the uh, the Chicago show next year, which is sort of a stopgap between the international show in New York 2016 and, and Boston 2026. Um, what has it been like to, to plan and work towards that with so much uncertainty and um you know, obviously so many so many question marks up in the air. 
you know, have you been hard at work on Chicago 2021 behind the scenes? And, uh, you know, uh, what, what has it been like preparing for this versus preparing for, you know, a show during more normal circumstances? You're not supposed to ask me the hard questions, man. Um, <laughs> this is not something I've you talked skip, about. You don't skip yet. that one? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's great. And it's not, it's really time to address it. I'm working on, I'm be working on my column for November. And this is one of the top, this is really the topic of conversation. So the reality is, I think it's unrealistic to plan a large scale event. We've looked at it. We've tried to skin the cat as many different ways as we can. I think with the, the level of uncertainty that we're dealing with, and we experienced this with Hartford this year, where you had, you know, people were determining for themselves before, long before the, the, I could even get a clear answer from Connecticut government uh, that, that they weren't going to attend. Cancellations really started to precipitate. And at that point, it became a question of, is this going to be a financially viable event for dealers? You know, if we're going to ask them to make the commitment to buy a booth, is it going to be worth their while to be there? And are they going to get a return on their investment? At, at virtually every stamp show prior to this year, absolutely has been the answer. I think, I think for the most part, we do very well at that. Our members really show up and rally for the dealers. But for Chicago, I, I, you know, looking at it now based on what the ambitions were when we started down this path in 2016, I think it's unrealistic to suggest that we should do the the mini international level show that we've talked about. So my focus has been on two things. Number one is on right sizing this show, given the conditions that I think we'll be under. There'll still be some, you know, there'll still be some uncertainty, but over investing in the show only to have a poor return for dealers, for the APS and for everybody else involved isn't something that's ideal either. You don't want to create a grand flop. If you notice all of the international shows that are canceling, canceled and go two years out, not one year out. I have to keep doing a show every, every year. So I, we, we are going to be a bit of a canary in the coal mine. I'm exploring some options in terms of what we should be doing with that space that are unique and different. I don't have commitments yet, so I can't really talk in detail about them, but uh, I am going to try to do something very differently with this show so that we can, uh, I think we can be representative of the hobby and we can do a very good job of putting together a show, even under these most trying conditions. So, uh, you know, if, if we hope that we're able to meet in Chicago next year, if we're able to, it will be more in line with a traditional stamp show, not necessarily the grand affair that we had originally planned. We do have some very special things, you know, we still want to tie it to the theme for the, the 150th of the Chicago Fire. We, we want to be able to uh, discuss, you know, we want to be able to have exhibits that focus on local culture. We have a lot of international groups who are very interested in coming. I think that pent up demand is going to continue to grow if we get to the point where our show is one of the first major events that comes out of the pandemic and gets planned. So we're working on those details now. We'll have more information in the coming weeks about what we're planning to do for Chicago. Uh, but it's, it's been like everything else. We're, we're kind of building the plane on the runway a little bit with this one. And so I'm trying to get that done resolved as quickly as possible. So we can talk about what Chicago is going to be, but I do think it's going to be a good event if we're able to do it. <laughs> Another event that's, um, that, that I was looking forward to going to was the, um, uh, classic society slash, uh, symposium coming up in just a couple of weeks. I was all ready to, um, to, to drive out to Belfont, what is that going to be like? Because that's one that obviously in, in such a short time frame, you're not looking at next year, you're looking at something, um, you know, not too far out. What's uh, what's on the agenda for, for that event? So we've got 12 speakers lined up right now. Interestingly enough, we opened registration on uh, over the weekend and we did a promotion through the APS email. We have about 330 registrations right now, which truthfully for a traditional postal history symposium is well exceeding the number that people would usually show up in person to do. But, and I think the strength of that again is about, it's centered around the programs. This is why I keep saying, you know, content is king. We don't focus nearly enough on the talks at a show, but I think when you give them a chance to spotlight like they're doing here, if you look at the, the list of speakers that we have, I mean, top to bottom, Scott Treppel is going to be the keynote speaker. And, you know, you've got Gordon Eubanks, Mark Schwartz, Trish Kaufman. You've got it's a, a who's who of it, it is a, it is a veritable cornucopia of the highest and best use of philatelist in the and in, in, that I've seen in any program so far this year. And 
Um, I want to give credit to the U.S. Philatelic Classic Society who did, who's been doing yeoman's work on helping us organize this and get it together. Uh, the talks, I think, are going to be very well done. They've got an exhibits page set up that they'll that ties into this. It will not be along the lines of what you would have seen if we'd been here in person doing the, even a non-competitive. Uh, but it's, it, you know, it's some of the finest material out there. And the great thing is, is that you really should go and look at that material because the probability is you're going to see a speaker who's put at least one or two of those exhibits together and would love to talk to you about those exhibits as well when these talks go on. So do your homework, make sure that you're ready to go because you have you have a chance to meet some of the finest philatelists in the country and even the world. And they are loaded for bear and ready to give you all the information. They're so generous with their time uh, that this is a great opportunity for anybody. And so if, if you haven't registered yet, come to our website, stamps.org, and we'll take you through the rest of the process. It is as easy as it can be. We learned about registration from the virtual stamp show and we have, we have changed it this time. So it's a very simple process. And I think everyone will find it to be, we only had one issue and so far in 300 plus applications. So uh, uh, I'm very optimistic about the show. I, I think it's gonna be, uh, I think it's gonna be a lot to learn. And I think in terms of how we should be going forward with things, the events that we're doing, this is gonna be a, a marquee event to, to, to look at. So you've been taking us kind of out out of the pandemic talk now. You've been APS uh, director of the APS now since 2015, um, following Ken Martin. Other than outreach, because your out, outreach has been phenomenal and, and your work to bring in new members has been phenomenal, what would you say has been the most difficult thing uh, for you as director of the APS to, to deal with uh, outside of the pandemic? I don't want to say it's been difficult. I mean, if, if you know much about my past, you know that I've had some I, I've, I've had some uh, interesting career trajectories, uh, you know, serving in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill, uh, going through shutdowns and impeachments of presidents and things like that, 9-11. Uh, and then I was fortunate enough to spend eight years in the governor's office in South Carolina, including three as chief of staff, where, you know, that was I uneventful, everything. right? Yeah, completely uneventful. <laughs> <laughs> everything from. Uh, from uh, man-made uh, disasters to uh, natural disasters to political disasters all in three years as the chief of staff. Um, and, and so, you know, when I came here, the number one priority for me, Michael, was to focus on two things. One is to establish financial stability for the organization, both the APS and the APRL, since I serve as the CEO of both, and put them on firm footing. Uh, one of the things that I'm reflecting on, for instance, is that when I, you know, when I got here, they had init just initiated the contract to build the new library that we opened in 2016. Uh, by the end of 2016, because of the costs associated with that, the unexpected costs that were associated with that, we were $5.4 million in debt. And today we're $1.7 million in debt. I announced at uh, our general membership meeting in August that we have an estate coming in that I'm working on closing out uh, that would bring in, you know, in, in addition to an estate from Fran Scheinwald, who was one of the first APS members I met in Grand Rapids when I got here. Uh, and uh, she passed away this year and she left $100,000 to both 50 to the APS and 50 to the APRL. But we have another estate coming in that should yield another $725,000 in cash. We're going to focus on putting that towards the mortgage debt as we have done. And we're going to get below a million dollars, which will be the lowest debt level we've seen in the 21st century. And my goal is that if we can do it, and we're working on the finances of that right now, if we can do it, I'd like very much to, to bury that debt this year. I mean, if you think about it, when I got here in 2016, I had to present a strategic plan six months on the job to the APS and the APRL boards in Atlanta. And at that time, what I said to them is our mortgage debt is, is if, if, you know, on the payment plan that we're on, our mortgage debt closes in 2035. I want to cut that in half. And, you know, I'll never forget looking around the room with a bunch of people who looked at me and were like, well, that's nice. They didn't <laughs> see the path to getting there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had, and, and part of it may have been bravado, but part of it was confidence that if you manage the resources of the organization right, that you can get there. 
And so, you know, it's a it's a bittersweet event when we lose a member who's been very generous to us and leaves a large amount of money that we can put it towards the uh, the mortgage debt, not to the operations of the organization. I mean, think about this. We, you know, we our revenues are off by about two hundred fifty thousand dollars as a result of the two month closure here. But we're still going to be cash positive by the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that that's a deliberate action that has to happen on a day to day basis in managing the resources of the organization, targeting them to the highest priorities you can do. Can we continue to grow? Absolutely, we can. That is my goal and my commitment over the next year is that we're going to continue to refine and improve what we've been doing. But I hope that in the the uh, and all of the things that have happened over the last five years, I just celebrated my fifth year anniversary in August, but I think it's, I hope it's been clear that we have really invested heavily in priorities that we think make the APS an attractive place to be a member. And also that, it, that we are an umbrella organization that is here to lift up every stamp collecting organization, not just our own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and yeah, bring so many valuable assets to the community. You, uh, made the APRL free for all users until September, September 30th. Was that specifically a, um, an outreach idea or was there other thoughts? It was just to bring members in or. It, it has certainly, I think it certainly helped in that we've noticed yeah. that subscriptions to the philatelic literature review are up. Okay. And I think that's a direct result of giving people a free taste of what we do offer. Mm-hmm. Um, and that they're willing to put up a, it's, it's eighteen dollars. I mean, good yeah. gosh, I can't believe everybody's not a, a member of the APR. I say that as a life member, but uh, I can't believe that everybody's not subscribing to the the AP, you know, to the Philatelic Literature Review. It's a wonderful quarterly magazine, and the library is one of our best assets. What what we wanted to do though is build an awareness of where we're taking the organization. So let's talk about post debt APRL. Mm-hmm. We're very close to that, and. When we get there, the, the beauty of having purchased the Match Factory and having this lease income come to the APRL is that we can, you know, unlike many libraries out there, we have a dedicated revenue stream that we can focus on building out services. You know, I, I, I've done research on this. We had a library early on in the days of the APS. It was, it was housed at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. And in 1929, we basically decided to abandon it. And the, the, the thinking behind that was that the geography alone was just an inconvenience to our membership, and it was unrealistic to expect them to go to Pittsburgh and use the library, mm-hmm. if you can imagine that. Now, fast forward 40 years, we created the APRL because we wanted to focus on research. And that mission has been set aside. I hate to say this, and I don't want to be overly critical, but you know that, that mission has been not set aside, but I think it's been weakened by having to go through this financial challenge of purchasing this building, doing the rehabilitation and, you know, paying off mortgage debt. But, you know, every year I can celebrate that we're paying less in mortgage debt than we did the year I got here and the year Mm -hmm. before that and so on. So the good news is, is we're very close to getting to that point where we can invest in the one thing that makes the library uh, it's a wonderful asset, but makes it difficult for our members. And that is geography. Yeah. So the digitization project that we want to undertake is an ambitious plan, but what it will do is it will really tear down the the difficulty of being able to access the information that we have in this hobby and create one place where we can pull all of it together. I mean, from the virtual stamp show alone, we have, I mean, we have 15 journals uh, in the digital library today, but from the virtual stamp show alone, we had an additional 20 different organizations who said, we want you to take all of our material, put it into this, digital library and make it a part of this research body that you're creating. So we've really got to pivot away from thinking about the fiscal aspects of Belfont, Pennsylvania, and focusing more on tearing down the geographical challenges that represent um, accessing the greatest philatelic library in the world. Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's incredible. I have to make a pitch. If I don't do this, Scott Tiffany will, uh, <laughs> will remind me that I didn't do it. And that is we have something called Adopt-A-Book that is aimed at helping to finance some of that. We've made a commitment through the Mighty Buck program for $25,000. If we can raise another $25,000, we can get equipment in. We can start getting the software in. We are going to need people. I mean, I look at we looked at Penn State's model. Penn State has 100 people today that are digitizing for their libraries. Now, we're we're not looking to go that big, but I would like to be able to add a couple of folks to at least on a temporary basis that can help us get this information from where it is 
up to the digital library a lot faster than we're doing it right now. And are those volunteers or are those employees that you're looking so at? So I would, I mean, I would imagine we're going to have to, we could probably work with the, uh, the, uh, the library services uh, program at Penn State and, and mm -hmm. hire a couple of grad students to work uh, on a 20, 30, 40 hour basis yeah. uh, as a grant program as part of their condition for their program. So we have a resource that we can tap into that would make it a lot more affordable for us to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and also give us the capabilities to move that product into the digital library a lot faster. Scott, I hope you don't mind me switching gears, um, you know, 180 degrees. Um, <laughs> we've had a lot of fun conversations over the last five years, non philatelically related. Of and course. you've given a lot of speeches in your five years. Um, so I'm sure you've, yeah, I, I know you've told a lot of anecdotes about yourself and you've talked about your political uh, career quite a bit, but I, I didn't know about your uh, career as a, a crabber on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I, you moonlighting <laughs> as a college DJ. Uh, and who, who was it public enemy you hung out with? Public enemy. Yes. When public we, <laughs> cause we, uh, I was a producer of a show at the radio station at the university of Maryland and <laughs> Uh, we had, uh, we were doing a show one night and, uh, I, uh, the phone rings, I answer it. It's, it's Chuck D who's the, you know, the head of public enemy and, you know, he's in the area, he's hearing this, the show, uh, and they, and they, they, these two guys were great DJs and the show actually carried on well beyond them. It lasted for about 14 years at the university of Maryland. So we started, uh, a program called soul controllers hour most folks watching this are going to have no idea the references to any of the things I'm talking about. But, you know, so the guy called, you know, I, I answered the phone. The guy says, yeah, I want to talk to uh, to the guys on the air. And I just said, well, who's calling? And he says, yeah, this is Chuck D. And I was just like, yeah, right. And so I hung up the phone because uh, I just figured it was somebody playing a prank on us. And I get another call back and he's like, yo, don't hang up this time. It's Chuck D. <laughs> and so I'm like, I don't believe you. And so he gives me a number of somebody to call and he goes, call them, ask them where I am and they'll tell you it, it, you know, who I am. So I call the number and of course the person verifies he's, you know, in DC and that they're doing a show there uh, and that it's probably him. So I call him back. He liked the show so much. He wanted to, he wanted to invite, uh, he wanted to invite us to come to a concert at the nine 30 club in DC, uh, which we did. And so after the show, we got to go backstage and, uh, you know, it's kind of weird when you think about, you know, here it is 19, 1991 and you got, I'm just some dumb white kid walking into the, <laughs> my 30 club. Uh, and I was definitely in the minority in this group. Uh, and, 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 you know, we got to hang out with them for about an hour and it was just a really fun time. I even got to meet Flavor Flav, uh, with his big clock dangling in my face as he shook my hand. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, that, that sort of answers my question. What I was going to ask, for people who know you as Scott English of the APS, or even Scott English, South Carolina Politico, uh, I was going to ask what, what a story was that you have not told the APS membership yet about your um, you know, previous, previous lives. What's something that people might be surprised to learn um, about, about Scott English pre-philately? So when I was at, in college, you know, I was thinking about a couple of different paths. Um, I had an interest in politics and uh, really for me, it was, you know, I grew up in a fairly humble family. Nobody in my family had ever gone to college. And so I was the, really the first person to go to college. And what I, what I saw politics as was really a public service, the idea of giving something back for all that it had been given to me. Um, I know that sounds crazy. Is that how but, everyone views it in Washington or? Uh, you know, everyone starts <laughs> off that way. I, I will tell you that it's a... Uh, it's a process to make you cynical is what it becomes. Um, but, you know, the other thing that I was thinking about was should I go to law school? And the, uh, the third thing was whether or not I wanted to go to film school. Uh, and so while I was at Maryland, one of the things that I dove into was, um, you know, getting in the theater, getting in the drama, directing plays, things like that, because I really wanted to explore that. Uh, apparently, I was a terrible actor. Uh, so I was told by my drama teacher, but I had a good sense of blocking and casting and things like that. So she felt like that it made more sense for me to look at the directorial side of things uh, rather than, than engaging in the, in the acting side of things. And so, uh, but it stuck with me. And so I, I really wanted to explore that a little bit. And so I, I, I will tell you, uh, and, and uh, my wife is going to kill me when I say this, but I will tell you that I, you know, I looked at three paths. One was uh, law school at the, uh, the University of Maryland in Baltimore. Uh, the other was going to film school 
and not to sound trite, but I mean, I did apply to NYU. Um, I really wanted to get into that program. Who didn't? In 19, I mean, in 1993, everybody wanted to go to NYU. And the third was probably getting a real job and more likely than not in Washington and getting married. Uh, and so for all of those things, what I decided to do was get married. And uh, I haven't regretted it a single day. My wife has probably regretted it every other day. But uh, <laughs> I, you know, I chose marriage over some of the, you know, I don't think anybody in the world would ever expect that I might have been, had been very close to going to film school and that I was interested in theater and drama or that I was a DJ on, on air for, for three years at the University of Maryland. You know, that was a very creative outlet side for me. Um, I have a passion for music. And so that was probably, I have a face for, for radio. So it worked out perfectly that I could get to time to be an on-air personality <laughs> are you working on a philatelic screenplay at any point was well, that uh... <laughs> you know actually the recovery of the jenny in 2016 really is worthy of a story that should yeah. be told um i have uh you know i i will tell you there's the official story and then the one that i believe is true which is um but i'm not going to opine on that here but uh <laughs> I, you know the the I th but I think all of the elements of that inverted Jenny, really from the time that it was stolen in until today, the allure around how we got each one of those back, the where those things could have been, we really need to, I really would love to be able to fill on those blanks. I can't tell you that I have uh, had made much path on that. It, mm -hmm. It's probably one of the most uh, well-kept conspiracies that's out there. But uh, but it's a fascinating story, just the the, the block that was stolen and how each piece has come back to the APRL. There's still one more out there and we still have a $50,000 check. So if anybody has it, I'm ready to do a ceremony anywhere. Socially distanced, <laughs> of course. <laughs> that can be your directorial debut when, uh, when you that's, find that fourth one. That's right. <laughs> so then what, what led you to the, the APS? You know, you, you went down that, that, path with DC and everything? How did you then? I can't imagine why you wanted to get out of politics after uh, <laughs> but, what but you that's put it. up with. And, and, you know, here I am, I'm five years out of politics. And, you know, leaving politics is like leaving an LA street gang. You either have to go out, you either have to go out in handcuffs <laughs> or go out in a box. There's no expectation that you would leave for any other reason. Why would you leave? Um, you know, even when you're past your shelf life, you can be a, an analyst or a commentator or a consultant or a lobbyist and those are all very lucrative businesses so why would i leave all of that um and the answer is this which is it it, it came at just the right time which is i needed a change in my life um you know I, I i loved the time that i spent in washington the time that i spent in south carolina and there are great experiences that came as a result of that and a lot of learning lessons along the way and a lot of good friends but i didn't see a path forward to being a meaningful player anymore. All I saw was that I could go be a consultant and, you know, you know, I could make $300 an hour opining or I could go and make a difference somewhere. You know, this, this organization got introduced to me by Mick Zace, who was our past president. He's now deputy secretary of education. When we worked together at the department of education, he brought me in to, to run the day-to-day -day operations of the department of education, which is pretty overwhelming. I mean, it's a thousand employees, $4 billion budget. Uh, and we had to, uh, we owned and maintained every school bus in the state of South Carolina. So we had to see to it that 6,000 school buses hit the streets every day and got kids back and forth safely. And those are pretty awesome responsibilities. And there I learned a lot of lessons. But one of the interesting ones that I picked up was mixed passion for philately. And um, as he, as we talked about it, he has a very genuine sense of why he's a collector. And I think most collectors do, they may not remember it or they may not relate it, but they have a genuine sense of why they're a collector. It brings a sense of calm, a peace. It gives you a chance to focus. It's a very introspective way to go about doing things. I find often talking to people about their collections is more telling than if you ask them questions about themselves. Right. But I got really interested in what I thought the hobby could bring to the world. And, and as I said earlier, you go into politics with the best of intentions, but you walk out of them feeling less than optimistic about things. And this organization, even though it was going through a lot of different challenges about being relevant, about growing membership uh, and the finances of it, none of that seemed daunting to me. I'd been in much worse conditions than that. So coming to take on those challenges really wasn't uh, intimidating. But what I saw was the potential and the prospect that came with stamp collecting 
um, the sense of community that exists within the stamp collecting organization, the fact that you can have people of all political spectrums sit together in a room and have an incredibly passionate discussion about philately and not once ever bring up a single elected official anywhere in the country. Um, and walk out of there as friends, even though they may consider each other, you know, completely out of their minds when it comes to politics. And it's the same thing with socioeconomic status. And I've seen people with, you know, very little means and people with great means who are coming together and having shared conversations and, and exchanging ideas and being being equals. And so for me, I really like the what the hobby reflects and I like what it can be. And I think it's we need more of it in this country, not less of it. And so if I can use what I've learned in politics to benefit the organization, then I thought we'd both, you know, we'd have a good time together. And, and as it's turned out, I, 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 I really have come to love and appreciate this community. I didn't think I'd last longer than five years. And here I am now working into my sixth year. Mm. Um, and look, I don't know what the future holds for, for me. I mean, the, the board could turn around tomorrow and ask me to leave. And I understand that too, but you know, I'm not looking for other opportunities. I'm not ready to run back to politics at any time soon because I think there's still so much more. And this year has been a prime example of what the positive benefits of philately have been about. When crisis hits, people have turned to their collections and we've seen people come back to the APS that haven't been members for decades because of it. And so my only hope is after the pandemic is over, after the crisis is over, that the, the genuine passion that people feel for their, their hobby doesn't go away. And that instead you take that opportunity to leave the house, to go and be an evangelical for the rest of the hobby and bring more people in. Yeah. So what, what would you say has been your most coming from politics, most successful outreach program that wasn't being done before you became the director? What, does such a thing exist? Did, did you come in and change a couple of things and then see massive increase of members or at least a, a little increase of members that's increased over time? Um, what do you feel has been, actually, this is kind of a separate question, your biggest influence on the APS? I think the introduction of technology to the scale that we're using it today is probably what I brought. Aside from what I hope is sound financial management and good leadership for the organization and for the hobby at large, the idea of being unafraid to try something different and the fact that failure is not necessarily uh, a deadly outcome, but rather an opportunity to learn and continue to grow forward. And we're, you know, it, 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 I mean, think about this. When I started this fundraising for technology, you know, I got a $25,000 donation from uh, New York 2016 with the condition that I go and raise a match of $25,000. And so, you know, I make this announcement and usually when you're doing fundraising and you go, okay, I've got a match to meet, people rise up and go, I'm gonna give money to that because I wanna see them get that other half. But in this case, when I started explaining what we wanted to do with technology, I have to be honest with you, there were crickets chirping. Mm. And, you know, I got kind of frustrated because we announced it in October of 2016, at the very end of February in 2017, um, Hugh Wood came into my office and he, he, he came to visit Belfont, you know, rest his soul. I, I miss him dearly uh, because his visits were some of the finest times that I spent at the, at the APC. He came into my office and we were, you know, we had a typical conversation where we talked about stamps, the business, so forth. And at the end of the conversation, he, he stood up and he said, by the way, I see that you're raising money. You have a match that you have to meet. And, you know, it's for technology. What, what is it you're planning to do? So I gave him the five minute version of that, walked him through what my vision was for technology improvements at the APS. And he said, well, how are you doing? And I said, not good, to be honest with you. I've raised $5,000 in the last five months. And he goes, so you need $20,000? And I said, yes, sir. And he goes, you'll have a check in two weeks. And I said, well, how much did you want to give? And he goes, son, we're going to go ahead and put this one to bed. I'm going to give you the $20,000. Wow. And he did. Um, and that really launched and it, his faith in us, his faith in this organization and the need for technology really launched us into what became a, about a $250,000 campaign that is gone into investing in the website has gone into, uh, making modifications to 
making modifications to Stamp Store to really helping us be able to launch what we were able to do in March of this year and a lot of other things on top of that. The, the website, I mean, if you think about this in these terms, the, the, the web traffic on a monthly basis today is 40,000 people. That's unique users that come to our website and, and they spend a considerable amount of time there now. We have 26,000 people who read the AP. So we know that not every person visiting us is an APS member. Given the pension of technology for some of our members, I know some of them aren't using it anyway. But so that shows you that we that that there's a that there's an underrepresented group of people out there. People used to call them closet collectors. I just don't think that's it. To be honest with you, they don't need to belong to the APS until they realize they need to belong to the APS. And so creating that value proposition has definitely become clear in this year for us in terms of recruitment, even though recruitment was very weak in March, April, and May of this year because of the pandemic. We couldn't even get renewals done or anything like that. But what we saw in June is an incredible rush to join the APS. So we, you know, we pulled in 210 new members. Uh, July was on target. August, we did 167. You know, the week we started the virtual stamp show, we had 40 new applications for the month of August. By the time we ended it, we had 167. Mm. Um, as of yesterday, we are 11 over all of September of 2019. So, you know, for me, it, that the finally being able to create that aha moment for the hobby to say, okay, he's been talking about technology for years. Now I understand it. Because remember, just delivering the, you know, building it doesn't mean they're going to come. So being able to help connect for our members, the need for this, you know, the technology that we're using today, the things that we're doing today and encouraging not just us to do it, but everybody else to do it too. You know, I, I, I was at the collector's club uh, presentation last night with David beach on zoom collector's club has done a phenomenal job. And we've been a, we've been a champion for what they've been doing. You know, it isn't, I get nothing for it other than the sense of satisfaction that I know that the collector's club is putting out a good product and that we're introducing as many people to it as we can. And if they recruit members, I'm a member of the collector's club. If they recruit members, then that's good for us. And the same is true for any other organization out there. We, you know, we put out a weekly email that, that is starting to build out all of the online presentations that are coming because so many different groups are now starting to adopt to that. And so if I can share with 25,000 people, the good news that the hobby has got a lot going on, and that we can fulfill your needs and it doesn't have to be a destination based hobby anymore, then that's what I'm after. And so we're at that moment. So I feel like this is a realization of five years of preaching. Right. Um, <clears throat> this pandemic has, has given, has accelerated, uh, accelerated to the point where we can now celebrate it and champion what we need to do next, instead of continuing to talk about the same things over and over again. So uh, I'm very encouraged about where we're at right now. I, I don't want to say i I alone am responsible for it, but I have been the loudest among those folks out there. I have been the most persistent out there, and I have tried to do everything that I can to put the APS at the forefront of making sure that innovation is alive and well in the hobby, and it certainly is. Yeah, and keeping those that on that trajectory with the technology will definitely be vital. I'm going to end with the softball question for you to make up for the Chicago question. <laughs> <laughs> what There's are no you most saying? <laughs> <laughs> what are you most looking forward to um, at your first in-person stamp show after this is all said and done? Whether it's Chicago, whether it's before Chicago, uh, what are you missing the most? What are you most excited about um, uh, when you set foot on a, a bourse again? The, the second column I ever wrote for the APS is you'll never meet a stranger at a stamp show. And as much as I enjoy seeing you guys today on camera and on, you know, to, to, to have a conversation about this, Charles, I miss just sitting there with you for, you know, half hour, 45 minutes and running through a gamut of conversations that we've gone through. A Bre year. Breakfast at Westbex. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it, it, dinner it, in New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> a great dinner in New Orleans, no less. <laughs> but that's it, right? It's, it's, the, it's being able to really be around people. It's, it's nurturing that friendship. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll expose one very uh, idiosyncratic syncretic thing that I've picked up since the pandemic has started. I, I have taken to writing notes and I realize how ironic it is, that especially when you guys have talked so much about how technology is going to move the hobby forward. But, you know, it's gotten to the point where I read a journal article, somebody wrote something really interesting. I send them a note 
or I see a local chapter president who's promoting the hobby in a newspaper in their neck of the woods, I send them a note. And it, it you know, I, I sent a note to somebody who did a presentation last week, told them how much I enjoyed it and all that other stuff. They sent me an email and said, thank you for the note. And I said, I realize how ironic this is that, <laughs> you know, as we're all leveraging technology to the greatest degree possible, that I've suddenly discovered the art of handwriting and decided to start sending notes out. But it's, it's because I miss that personal connection with, I've made a lot of friends in this hobby and have, have been able to learn so much, both about philately and about a lot of other th things through the connections that I've made here. We have an incredibly diverse population in our community. And um, if you listen long enough, you get to learn a lot from people. Uh, and, and I've really benefited from that. But you know, my last show was Sarasota in February, and I haven't been to a show since then. And I, I, I haven't hit withdrawals yet of air travel, but I will tell you that the, you know, the minute you touch ground in the city and you start going through the list of people that you know you're going to see, who's on the jury, who's on the show committee, um, being able to meet some new people and talk to some dealers, I miss that. Um, I really yeah. do. And, and a phone conversation and a Zoom meeting don't replace that. It, we've got to continue to nurture those friendships. Um, that's the only way this hobby is going to survive and thrive. Absolutely. I think the most important thing we learned today is why the USPS is having all these delays. It's because you started sending notes to everyone. <laughs> it's just clogged up the system. <laughs> Whatever I could do to support a fine, fine institution like the United States Postal Service, I'm happy to do. I, 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 I even bought innovation stamps, which, uh, you know, I, I, I laugh every year and about this because, you know, 2018, we got the uh, the dragon stamps, which of course were voted subsequently by Lynn's readers as the worst stamp issue of the year. <laughs> Last year, we got military working dogs in Omaha, and it was voted by Lynn's uh, readers as the worst new issue of the year. But I will say the events themselves were fantastic. I mean, the one that we did in Columbus, I mean, we had 100 kids in the audience, and they were really fired up to meet Perf the Magic Dragon. And uh, last year, when we, we need Omaha, to get them to vote in the Lens poll next time, get all the kids to <laughs> get all the kids to vote. Yeah. Uh, but I, the minute I saw the innovation stamp, I said, there it is. That's the one. And then I get a phone call that says, OK, we want you to do the first day. Issue. <laughs> and I feel like it's almost a dare sometimes from the stamp services department to give us the stamp that they know stamp collectors are going to hate the most and see if we can make a good event out of it. And um, to all credit to the American First Day Cover Society this year, because we did a virtual first day and Foster Miller and Lloyd DeVries did all of the work to, to really organize things together. Um, and I think it turned out to be a very interesting one. Uh, it is, uh, you'll laugh, but on our, on our Google page, it is the second most viewed video in the last 30 days. Um, the highest being the welcome ceremony for the virtual stamp show. But, mm -hmm. uh, and so, so statistically speaking, it, it's going to, it's got all the makings of, of a very successful event. And then I expect full well that the readers of the, uh, of Lynn's will vote at the worst new issue of 2020. <laughs> and so that'll be three years in a row. <laughs> well, this has been great, Scott. Thank you so yeah. much for taking the time to chat with us. It's yeah, been absolutely. a lot of fun. Again, I, I, I saw you in Sarasota briefly. I didn't, I don't think either of us expected that was going to be, uh, be it for a while. Yeah, no kidding. Well, listen, one last thing, guys, I really yeah. want to I really want to encourage you for what you're doing. I, I, I wasn't sure what to expect when you guys started this. I didn't know if it was just going to be here. Neither were we. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's here. Let's get a collector on and let them talk about uh, what they've acquired in the last six months since they haven't been able to tell anybody what they bought. But you've really turned this into more than just that. It's it's great thought leadership. It's very much focused on the cutting edge of the hobby. And it's really emphasizing what can be for the hobby. And so I really appreciate what you guys are doing and I want to encourage you. And so for anybody who's watching this, who, who is too afraid to participate in this, it's really worthwhile. And I really hope folks will continue to, to help you do a weekly show and continue to get a good conversation, a good chat out of everyone. The, yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate that very, very much. Kind, yeah. yeah. We, we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into, but we've had a yeah. lot of fun and, uh, and and we we hope to keep doing it for a while so we, we'd love yeah. to have you on again um you know Absolutely. check back in and in a couple of months and uh see where where things are at yeah well as you know it, uh, i'm an irish but then so we we jokingly refer to ourselves as good listeners when we only talk half the time so <laughs> <laughs> i'm happy to come on anytime and chat with you guys <laughs> and, and, and yeah. someday we'll do a remote episode from belfont if that's all right yeah 
Oh man, that would be a lot of fun. I think we could, uh, I could even pick a couple of good locations for us to try it out at. Yeah, Let's that'd do be it. perfect. All that'd right. Be great. Sounds like a deal. Thanks a lot, Scott. Hey, thanks so much. Thank, thanks a lot. Good seeing you both. Take care. You too. You too. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. I knew that was going to be a fun chat with Scott English. I miss seeing him at shows. As I mentioned, I saw him in Sarasota in February of this year. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, it's always just one of the sales. See you see Garfield Perry, you see it, you know, uh, West Pex or whatnot. And uh, there was no next show for us. So yeah. um, it was great to be able to catch up. I, you know, in, in addition to, I think he was a, a really good interview and a good guest for us. Yeah. But just personally, it was nice to be able to um, catch up with Scott as well, because I, I miss seeing him on the road. Yeah, I'd never, I'd never, again, I'd never met him before, but um, he's super personable, super, super uh, nice. And always and got to to, yeah. a great story. Absolutely. Yeah, it is always something to, uh, to make you laugh. Um, yeah. You know, whether it's about stamps or, or his other, uh, you know, his other lives, his other yeah. um, forays uh, into various careers. Uh, he, he's just a really interesting character and, and I someone think, I always enjoy talking to. I think what he's done in his tenure at uh, as APS director has been phenomenal. I mean, if we can keep on the trajectory of, of, well, of... It, it, it's one of those things. It's so easy to focus on membership or technology. Um, you know, I, I, I don't give much thought to the finances of an organization right, like right. that, but when he explains what he's done and when you look at the, the donations that have been received and the way different accounts have been paid off uh, you know, the mortgages and whatnot, um, it's really important. Again, I want to focus on the stamps. You want to focus on the stamps. You know, it's easy for us to just say, ah, it's mm-hmm. the APS. We want to hear about stamps. But he's worrying about all the stuff that the membership doesn't want to deal with. Right. And I think that's really impressive. I think that's really important to acknowledge. Well, yeah, he that, recognizes that if it wasn't there, if he wasn't there to do it, then the, the APS might not be there. I was going to say everything else suffers. It's not what we want to hear about. It's not what we want to think about. Mm-hmm. He's the one, you know, dealing with all of that stuff that's not as... Yeah glamorous is putting on a stamp show so i think i think that's really important to give him credit there yeah. um for for the money management and the financial longevity of the aps um he's just worked wonders yeah but then also uh being a spokesman for technology in the hobby and and uh and everything yeah, I, he's done to promote that how it, he only has 24 hours in his days i, I right? don't know because what he again the different hats he has to wear as um you know again uh behind the scenes and uh in front of the camera he's uh he's he's just doing great things for the APS i think um i think we're in good hands yeah well his background in politics i'm sure definitely helps they have to juggle so many things at at, at once that that this is um there's probably nothing for him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well that yeah. was a, that was a really great episode I, again he's someone we should touch base with every once in a while he's uh, he's someone we should keep in our regular circulation of uh yeah. of guests because i i think he um uh, again, he has a unique insight that, that really no one else can provide. Right. He's because uh, he's at the helm. He's the leader of the. Yeah, he camps. sees things just in a totally different, uh, you know, from a totally different point of view than the rest of us. So let's yeah. let's talk to him again. Let's go see him in Belfont at some point. Let's do a, yeah, that'd be, that'd an episode great. from the American Philatelic Center with uh, with Scott English in person. Maybe he can take us on a little tour or something. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Ex- Me too. So um, as always, we're on. Google, Pod, Google Podcast, Apple yep. Podcast, Spotify Podcast, yep. Podbean, YouTube. Tons of other places. Tons of, yeah, whoever hosts podcasts, whoever picks yep. up our RSS feed. Yeah. Um, which I, that's beyond my uh, technological understanding. Well, people understanding, want it. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, we just show up places. It's great. Yeah. Um, and, and we have a website, flatterlypodcast.com. Email yep. is flatterlypodcast at gmail.com. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe true. we can even do. You know. Again. And look, Scott's not shy from doing Q and A's um, and uh, membership and whatnot. But um, you know, maybe, maybe we can even field some questions from our listeners. Uh, what yeah. they would want to hear from Scott English next time. So uh, it was a lot of fun, and, and let's do it again. Yeah. As always, I'll see you next time. Sounds good. We'll talk soon, Michael. All right. See ya. Bye.